Tonight, we're going to be looking at some of the material that, that Joe uh, led you through last Wednesday night, laying the foundation for some of the things that I want to highlight tonight. Uh, this particular section of Ephesians 1 or 4, chapter 4, 1 through 16, is one of my favorite passages in all of Paul's writings. There, there's so much that Paul is going to talk about that is central to the life of the church. And it's central to the health of the body of Christ. It's so central to each person finding their place in the body of Christ. Um, it, it's hard to find uh, 16 verses that deal so prominently with what the church is all about. Uh, now, of course, the whole book of Ephesians does that. But boy, these 16 verses are amazing. And we've entitled our lesson, When Each Part is Working Properly. Uh, this is a great image or a metaphor that Paul uses later on in chapter 4, 1 through 16. You know what it's like when parts of your body don't work properly, don't you? The, the grief, <laughs> the grief that that can bring, the pain that that can bring, the unhealthiness that that can portray, uh, all those things that you can say that you've experienced when the parts of your body don't work properly. Now, by comparison or spiritual connection, think of how that is true with the church that it is crucial for every member or part of the body to be functioning and working properly. Um, when that doesn't happen, you have unhealthy congregations. Uh, I am fascinated by some uh, research that's been done, not just recently, but say within the last 10 or 15 years, that deals with what um, uh, church, what's the word I want to, uh, church uh, statisticians and logicians and all those that study dynamics about church, but they like to use the word um, healthy congregations. And it is interesting, uh, when you look at all that literature, people sometimes of what constitutes a healthy congregation. Uh, one individual said it just boils down to this. It's a place where you either like to be or you don't like to be. <laughs> well, that's getting pretty basic. But it's a little bit more than that. It's not just where I like to be or not like to be. For Paul, it is asking the question, is every part working properly? Does every member have a place in the body? Do they recognize that place? Are they encouraged to work properly and function properly in that body. Um, there are some larger congregations that recognizing this very thing we've talked about, um, hire full-time individuals that they give the label involvement ministers. There are congregations that have involvement ministers. And the, the theory behind that or the philosophy behind it is that every person, every Christian that's a part of the body of Christ needs to be involved meaningfully in some ministry. Using their gifts to build up the body of Christ and to reach out and to serve others. And sometimes people just need to be encouraged to do that. Sometimes they need to be shown how to do that. Need to be led where to go. And some churches then are just hiring involvement ministers and that's their role, which to me is fascinating. And it does have a good biblical foundation. As we begin looking at this section, I wanna start off with the observation that when Paul wants to talk about each part working properly, he wants to begin by the observation or actually the, the urging 
of his readers, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Now the NIV says the calling with which you've received, but really it is literally the calling to which you've been called. And it's, and it's uh, that wording that Paul's gonna use to help his readers understand every Christian has received a call. Unfortunately, in the history of uh, Christian thinking and writing about ministry and talking about ministry, we've gotten to the point where it's, it's just second nature for us to take the word calling and, and sort of use it to label, and, and I don't mean label in a bad way, but, but use it to identify specific aspects of ministerial calling. And, and we'll talk about people being called to a particular ministry. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that except when we do that all the time, we eliminate the bigger calling. Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling with which you've been called. The Christian life is a calling. And if we could just understand that when we respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, that means we have responded to the calling of God. And in turn, God's calling upon us then to live a life worthy of that calling, okay? And as Paul begins this particular section, he's going to refer to himself as a prisoner for the Lord. It's intriguing to me all the different ways that Paul refers to himself. He is an apostle, an apostle he admits that is born out of due season. You know, he came along kind of on the tail end and he, he realizes that his apostleship and calling was quite unusual. So unusual in fact that nobody else that we know of was ever called by the Lord the way Paul was. That's how unique his calling was. Uh, he refers to himself then as an apostle. He's a servant. And he's also a prisoner for the Lord. Uh, think about what it means to be a prisoner for the Lord and why Paul would use that imagery. And that would make a great lesson just in and of itself. That this calling is a response to the will of God and you realize that you've given up so much of your will that you're a prisoner for the Lord. That I can only do what the Lord tells me now. I can only go where he tells me to go. I can only say what he wants me to say. I mean, it's a real strong image that Paul appropriates for himself, a prisoner for the Lord. Now, as he talks about this Christian life as a calling, he, he wants to demonstrate that it's a kind of calling where you walk worthily of that calling. There's a manner in which you walk. And in Paul's writings, more than any other New Testament writer, Paul likes to refer to this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me and I wanna look at a few passages of scripture that talk about um, this kind of walking worthy in a manner of the gospel to which you've been called. The first is Romans 16 verse 2. And this is where he's writing to the church at Rome and he commends to them. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, uh, a servant of the church in Sincre, Sincrea. NIV says a deacon or a deaconess. Um, I think that's reading into it too much. It's a, uh, it's, she's a servant um, of the church in Sincrea. Look at verse 2. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you for she's been the benefactor of many people, including me. Uh, and this is a fascinating side study if we ever wanted to do it. 
but both Jesus and the apostles um, were benefactors or the recipients of female benefactors. That there were ladies who were Christians who apparently had the means to support Jesus financially and to support the apostles and here specifically Paul financially. Uh, what drives us nuts is that's all the detail he gives us because after he makes that comment we can come up with 50 questions we wish we knew <laughs> we had the answers for uh, but it certainly uh, kind of cracks the door open for a fascinating insight in how the early church functioned especially the apostles but notice what he says I asked you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people that's the thing we want to highlight here, that the Christian calling is, is a concept that I'm living in a way that is worthy of God's people, worthy of the gospel, a manner that is worthy, that represents what I really need to represent. Now, of course, he's not talking about a life of perfection. Otherwise, we'd all be in trouble. But what he's talking about here is living the kind of life that's going to represent what the gospel is all about. And he's even asking those Christians at Rome to respond to Phoebe in such a way that is worthy of their calling of being Christians. He said, you know, you call yourself a Christian. I believe you are. Well, let's respond to her in a way that demonstrates to her you are Christians. Uh, look at Philippians 1.27. This concept for Paul uh, is very important as he encourages Christians to live the way they should. Philippians 1.27 Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I'll know that you stand firm in one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. So whatever happens, you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's almost what I call one of those life principles. Uh, that's almost a verse that is so, uh, it's almost like uh, an umbrella that it covers everything about the Christian life that you could see this as a principle by which Paul lived and functioned. That whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and the reason I think this is so important for Paul, he was constantly thinking about how does my life, how do my words, how do my actions and behavior reflect positively for the gospel of Christ. He was constantly thinking about that. Uh, he always wanted to make sure that whatever he said, however he acted, and whatever he did would um, help opportunities for doors to open for the gospel of Christ to be shared. I think the worst thing that would have crushed Paul's heart is if he ever knew something he said or did or whatever would have closed the door to someone saying, well, if that's what Christians are like, I don't want to hear. See, Paul's all about giving the gospel of Christ to hearing. And maybe that's something we take too easily for granted, that, that we need to constantly be thinking, what is our manner of life like? Is it worthy of the gospel? in terms of everything I say and do, my behavior, choices I make, how I interact with people, is it in such a way that it's going to open doors for people to hear the good news about Jesus? And, and that, that's pretty, pretty foundational and pretty important, isn't it? Uh, look at Colossians 1.10. Colossians chapter 1. In verse 10, actually, let's start with verse 9 where the thought starts. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will 
through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. See, again, he's, it's, it's that attitude that wants to please the Lord and every aspect of your life is such that it is going to be lived in a manner worthy of the gospel and in a manner that's going to please the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12. Let's start at verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you. Well, notice what that fatherly wrote, uh, that fatherly role did. Encouraged, comfort, urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So again, in that role, spiritual fatherhood, he's encouraging his readers, comforting them, and urging them to live lives worthy of God. Okay? And this is part of the Christian calling. Um, one last reference about this uh, particular aspect of walking worthily of the calling, and that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.11 With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? And again, He is praying this on their behalf that God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Boy, this, this gets at the heart of Paul's understanding of calling and how Christians are to live. Now, back in our lesson text in Ephesians 4, as Paul is talking about this, living this um, Christian walk and this calling in a worthy manner, he's actually, in the context here, in chapter four of Ephesians, he's gonna give four aspects of the manner in which you are to walk worthy. He's very clear. For Paul, right here, walking worthy worthily of the calling with which you've called means that you walk with all humility. Number two, all gentleness. Number three, with patience. Number four, bearing with one another in love. Four very specific things he mentions that deal with walking in a manner worthy of your calling. All of these four things have to do with our interaction and relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I suppose that if we lived a solitary life all by ourselves, we could say without hesitation, uh, we would be humble. Nobody around to say yes or no, I'll just claim that I'm humble. And that I'm gentle. Nobody around to say I'm not, so I'm gentle. Uh, I'm patient, although sometimes you can be alone and you can discover still, <laughs> if things go wrong, how impatient you are. <laughs> and then number four, bearing with one another in love. Well, I could be by myself and claim that I bear with one another in love. But notice that the test case here is that all four of these are lived out in relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ in the body of Christ. Wow. That's why 
it's crucial to asking ourselves the question, how do we live out the gospel? Is it in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which we've been called? And does it include with all humility? Um, what's a good definition of humility? What, what's a good definition? What would you think of? How do you know that you're pursuing this path with all humility? What is humility? Not thinking too highly of yourself. It's almost, because you said it that way, Tom, I almost get the impression it's kind of the opposite of conceit, isn't it? When we think of a person who's conceited, what do we think of? Someone who thinks too highly of themselves. Okay, so humility is probably the opposite of that. It comes up with an attitude of lowliness and obedience grounded to recognition of one's stature before God and the scriptures. Yeah. Well, yeah, Johnny, that I would say that's the core of it is that I recognize before God who I am. And without God, who am I? Without Christ, who am I? I'm a sinful self is who I am. Self-centered, self-absorbed, um, you know, all kinds of sinfulness describe who I am. But when I live a life of humility, I give up self. Uh, it is a, it's a pursuit of recognizing how important the will of God is in my life. It, it's as if I'm on a journey of trading my will for God's will. And that's not always an easy thing. I almost look at humility as like a lifelong pursuit. Um, I don't know that you ever can quite get to the point where you say, aha, tonight I'm 100% humble. <laughs> I don't think we can quite get there, but but it but it is it does make a difference though, if we conceive of ourselves on the journey of humility. That I recognize it's not about me. Uh, the world doesn't revolve around me. I'm part of the body of Christ, and it's not about me. It's about the body of Christ. So I think you guys are right. It's this kind of thinking that recognizes. Um, who I am in the sight of God, how God truly sees me. Yeah, that's very good. And, it, and it's this path of humility. And then the second one is uh, gentleness. Um, very important word when it comes to character formation. Uh, oftentimes it's coupled in the New Testament with the idea of kindness, kindness and gentleness. Uh, there's just something about a person who is gentle that that indicates what's going on inside of them. A person who lacks gentleness is exhibiting behavior that speaks loudly of inner turmoil. Uh, and, and you know this. You've been, been around people who have inner issues, uh, just troubling things in their heart and life that they haven't adequately dealt with. And guess what? You just happen to be the next person that come along and they dump on you their unfinished inner business. And that's unfortunate because that means that this inner life of gentleness and kindness uh, is not something that they possess. Um, in fact, recently I asked a person, I want you to think about your life. Um, would you say that your life before becoming a Christian was one where you possessed inner peace. And they said, oh no, no way. And I think that as Christians, we should maybe be more aware that gentleness and kindness when we relate to other people comes from an interior place in the heart of peace that God has given us. Uh, patience is the same way. How patient are we? Well, not in the strictest sense, though I would say, Cloyd, 
that depending on whether you are an introvert or extrovert, um, it might um, have a huge uh, impact on how you experience all four of these and uh, certainly different challenges that you have. Uh, one of the things that's amazing about personalities is that, and there's different ways of looking at personalities. Uh, there are some ways that are only sociologically grounded that don't have a good biblical foundation. Um, but when you begin to look at personality types, each one has its strength and its weaknesses. Um, there's, there's, there's two different kinds of uh, well-known personality trait um, inventories that you can take. And when I have individuals take those and we meet in my office for counseling, uh, I'm always constantly making sure that each one of the points we're talking about are grounded in what I call a biblical view of uh, humankind. Because you don't want it to stay just clinical and you don't want it to stay just sociological, but it's very biblically founded. And uh, some fascinating discussions come out of that when people begin to discover who they are and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And, and I, I, I'd say that's a great question, Chloe, because I would suspect that if you're an extrovert, that what you struggle with with humility might look a little different from the person who's introverted, <laughs> okay? And then I suspect that when it comes to gentleness, maybe a person who's extroverted would have uh, sort of unique challenges with that as opposed to the introverted person. So, uh, uh, I always say that it takes both in the kingdom to make the body of Christ work. We need extroverts and we need introverts. We need us, uh, we need us all, so to speak. And uh, the extrovert is not any more important than the introvert. And we all need to realize that, I think. Now, the second thing tonight is the motivation in maintaining the unity of the spirit. Um, Paul is going to mention in chapter 4 that he wants them to be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit. This is to be done in the bond of peace. And this is where often Satan can do his worst damage. Because the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is only something that the Spirit of God can create. It's our responsibility to maintain it. And too often, we don't take that responsibility seriously. But maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, um, all sorts of wonderful principles come into play here. Remember in Romans 12, uh, Paul, <laughs> and, and I, I've often wondered Boy, if we could just sit Paul down and ask him, what was he thinking of when he said this in Romans 12? If at all possible, live peacefully with all men. If at all possible. Well, I know that there were probably some situations where he recognized this is just hopeless. It's not possible to live peacefully. And also you may remember uh, in Acts when he had that falling out with John Mark. For some reason... There was that point in his ministry where it didn't look like that they could peacefully work together. Sometimes there are those falling outs. Uh, but there, there's a lot of principles like that that go along with what does it mean to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul's going to have what I call the biblical platform for uh, spiritual unity. Uh, look at what he says in verse 4 of Ephesians 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope with which you were called. And there again, there's that word calling. As a Christian, you know, live worthily of the calling with which you've called. But now, he says, you're called to one hope when you were called. So there's one hope, there's one body, there's one spirit. 
one Lord, one faith. Look at the unity of the faith, one baptism. Now that was important for Paul to say because um, from the time of Jesus up until the time of Paul, there were several different options for baptism. Uh, the Jews had a baptism. Uh, there were other types of washings and baptisms that were related somewhat to your uh, Greek mystery religions. Um, then there was John the Baptist baptism. Uh, there was Christ baptism. There was being baptized in the spirit. So there, were, there, there was a lot of uh, different kinds of baptisms. And I think when he says one baptism, it is obviously being baptized in the water and the spirit for the Christian. Uh, I think if we were to write it ourselves, we would have said something like, there's one Christian baptism. That's what he's talking about. One, go ahead. Yeah, Johnny. John chapter 17, verse 11. It reads, it says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I'm coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Yes! What a wonderful scripture, Johnny. Let, let's, take, let's take that and add on to what Paul's saying here because it's so crucial. Unity in the body of Christ serves two things and two things at once. Number one, the health of the body, okay? But because the body or because the body demonstrates that kind of unity, it is a witness to the world. It's so that the world may know that you have sent me. And often, I'm not quite sure if we think enough about that. We tend to just restrict our ideas of unity. It's, it's just between us getting along. Well, it's a lot more than that. When we get along in the Lord, which is a good way of saying it, I like that expression, it's for the purpose of witness to the world that doesn't know the Lord. It's so that the world may know that you have sent me. What a great witness that is. And, and this is just so typical in Paul's thought. And Jesus is you know, saying this, and Paul taps into it all the time. That when I live out the implications of my Christian life, there's more at stake than just my little world. And we need to remember that when a congregation of God's people takes seriously the call to unity and maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, it's not just about us when we do that well, because that feels good when we do it well, okay? But it serves as a witness to the larger world and community. And, and, and we don't want to ever forget that because it's more than just us and what we like, you see. It is actually God working through that unity to keep the kingdom of God out here where people can see it at work. Yeah, and Johnny, thank you for bringing that verse up because that's the next step that Paul always has in mind, whether he always articulates it or not, that's always behind his thinking with all of this. You know, how can we be a witness to the world that doesn't either know about Jesus or has not responded to him in obedience yet? Yeah, Paul's always thinking about that. Okay. Um, this maintaining the unity of the spirit, there's another aspect of this unity that's, that's amazing to me and we don't want to miss it. It's verse six. There's one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This is what I call the sovereign unity of God. That God and Christ and the spirit are three in one. Unity among God's people is not just some abstract idea that happens to make it nice to be part of church. Unity of God's people is a concrete example of the unity and nature of God. Wow. We become divine for the world. God is one. We as God's people are one. 
How do people know about God? Well, if they're not going to read scripture, the only way they know about God is by watching how God's people live together and how they are. And unity among God's people would be a natural expression of the unity of God's essence as Father, Son, and the Spirit. And Paul, it, it's, it's amazing to me. That's how he ends this little section on what unity is all about. He grounds it in the very essence and being of God. Now, Paul is going to talk about this graced giftedness. It's connected to the reality of unity. Um, he wants to teach each one of us, yes, we are individuals in the body, and we have been given a gift when we became a Christian. And this is according to the measure of the gift of Christ, either himself, Christ himself is the gift, or the gift of salvation that comes from him. And it could be one or the other. Uh, look at how Paul develops this even more. In Romans 12, beginning with verse 3, this is probably the area in Paul's writings where he talks about being graced with the gifts of Christ for the body. Uh, Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Well, there's our contrast between humility and conceit that we talked about earlier. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Um, every time I've had dis serious discussion with individuals about this part of Romans, uh, there's a vigorous discussion that ensues. And I'm gonna make a statement here and you don't have to agree with it. <laughs> but here's what it sounds like to me. What it sounds like is that there's a dimension of faith that God distributes to each one of us. Now, that's not how we often talk about faith, is it? Usually we talk about faith as something we possess. Um, it's something we do. It's our response to the will of God. I mean, we have all these, all these wonderful ideas that, that kind of go along with faith. But I doubt that we often think of this dimension of faith that God has distributed to each of you um, in accordance with the faith that they have. Why is that? Verse four, for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. It, Paul is trying to say God has made us who we are. When we become a Christian, he distributes a kind of faith to us that allows us to use our gifts for the body because we're no longer on our own anymore. It's not about me as an individual anymore. We all belong to each other. That's why there, there's a part of the Christian faith that runs directly counter to a deep-seated value of our American culture. Uh, Robert Bella is the uh, sociologist who was famous for saying this, but back about 20 years ago when he wrote a book about America and the title of that book was called Habits of the Heart. And he just was sort of kind of painting the picture of American culture. And he used the expression rugged individualism. And boy, is that a true word. I like that phrase because that is so true for a lot of us. But when it comes to the body of Christ, the idea of rugged individualism for my identity disappears. It's not about me being as rugged as I think I can be and living solitary and I don't need anybody and I certainly don't want you in my business. No, that's not the way Paul talks about it. Paul talks about it in terms of we belong to each other now. What you do, I care about. And what I do, you care about. I mean, it, it's different now. And uh, so all of the cultures in which Christianity has existed, where this rugged individualism has been sort of a high cultural value, 
There have been a lot of clashes philosophically over what that needs to look like. And all of us living in the American culture here in East Tennessee as we do, uh, we're really challenged with that. Um, it's so much easier for us to want to do our own thing than to immediately ask the question, okay, how's this gonna affect so-and-so in the body of Christ? Um, what does it mean for me to belong to you and you to belong to me? Uh, where I have seen this really come out well is people uh, becoming involved in small groups and realizing, yeah, I do belong to you and you do belong to me and some accountability. Yeah, go ahead, Herb. Yeah. Uh, doing what he wants to do. And he knows that if he becomes a Christian, some of that's got to go away. Yeah. And, and that's hard to teach a man. It is. I, he don't want to give that up. <laughs> You're exactly right. Um, and I have had individuals who've gotten a good insight into that. And they have told me, I think I know what you're saying. And what it's going to take for me to be a Christian, I'm not ready to do that. Well, at least they're honest, you know, obviously. And, but I think you've nailed it because a lot of people are so comfortable with the way they're living life on their terms that when they begin to have the view that becoming a Christian means I've got to get rid of some of that because I, I become part of community. Life is much better here <laughs> oh, with wow. a group of people that you think yeah. Alive. Yeah. And you do things alive. Exactly. If you just get in and, and get your feet wet. <laughs> and and for a lot of people, that first step of getting in and getting your feet wet, ooh, that's a big one. It really is. But I, I think you've hit the nail on the head that um, there are individuals who who do come to that awareness of what it might mean for them that they'll have to give up and things will have to change. And as a result, they choose not to. But what they don't understand is what you said, Herb. They don't realize what they're actually giving up. That if, if they would go ahead, in fact, I've caught myself saying this to individuals just within the last, seems like four or five years. I'll say to them, you know what you need to do. Why don't you go ahead and do the hard thing and see what good comes out of it? And they're like, oh, I've never had anybody say that to me before. Well, you know what you need to do. It is the right thing. You know it's right. Yes, it's hard. Go ahead and do the hard thing and see what good comes out of it. I challenge them. Um, and I think people need to be aware of that. That yes, it is hard, but hard doesn't mean impossible. <laughs> and, and you refusing to do the hard thing really means you're gonna miss out on some good stuff. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, we got, oh my, we got to hurry here. Uh, the next thing on uh, each part working is to equip and build up. That's the purpose uh, for each part doing its work. We help equip one another. We build one another up. Um, it's interesting, the quote in Ephesians chapter 4 about Jesus ascended on high. He took many captives and gave gifts to his people. It's a quote from Psalm 68, 18. Uh, no doubt Paul read Psalms a lot. He likes to quote from the Psalms. And this particular reference in Psalm 68 has to do with God giving gifts to his people and providing in difficult times. And what he really latches onto is that Christ gave gifts and these gifts that he distributes in the body of Christ and notice how specific Paul's going to get here in a little bit. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and all of these different individuals in the body of Christ is so that they can equip and build up one another. Uh, the goal is mature manhood. Uh, for Paul, spiritual growth and maturity is high on his list all of the time. When he writes to Christians, he is constantly concerned that they're going to come a full age spiritually 
and have the kind of quality or status that's going to be attained in Christ by growth and development. And in this particular passage, he contrasts that with no longer being children. Spiritually, children are tossed to and fro by every wave or wind of doctrine that comes by. Anything that looks like a good scheme, someone's cunning, if you're not rooted and grounded in the body of Christ, the least little thing is just gonna to toss you around like crazy. I've seen people like that, haven't you? They're not, their faith is not rooted and grounded in the word of God, in their walk with God. They're not sure of their calling with which they've been called and they're not close to the body of Christ and least little thing comes by, you know, they're, they're just easy target. Now, Paul says that this uh, idea of each part working properly means there's very important concept of speaking the truth in love. Uh, this is an amazing verse because literally Paul's going to take a noun and make a verb out of it. Truthing in love. So that he's not just talking about speaking the truth, though that's included. But the idea of truthing something is more like your whole life is the truth of that. That whether I'm talking about my speech, whether I'm talking about my behavior, whether I'm talking about my motives and my thoughts, all of that is truthing everything in love. And Christian love then is the glue for maturity. Uh, and that's contrasted, like we said earlier, with being like children. Um, and then it leads to the final thing here quickly. What makes the body grow? Paul says for it, to, it needs to grow up in every way. And so we think about all the ways that the body could grow. But Christ is the head being joined together and held together. Every joint is supplied, being held together, joined together. Uh, and I want to end with a reference to this word supply, because it's so important. In Paul's day, this word supply was a simple noun that originally indicated a payment for the cost of bringing out a chorus at a public festival. So somebody financially supplied everything that was necessary for this public event. Then it signified provisions for an army or expedition. And the word as it's used here uh, in Ephesians 4 uh, also was used as a technical term, and this is interesting, describing the provision of food and clothing and everything else which a husband was obligated to make for his wife. Uh, that in legal terms, at least in Greek and Roman thought, the husband was to supply everything the wife um, was bound to have. So he was obligated to do that. Here, the word supply then indicates that the body, the joints with all of its tendons and ligaments and everything built together and held together, the body receives from Christ the nourishment the life, the health, the direction, the growth, uh, the healthy development, everything that you want to say comes from Christ. Uh, it's almost like if you continue the thought of uh, a body and parts of the body, think of how, think of what the blood system supplies for the whole body. Okay, And when each part is working and functioning the way that it should, Christ, who is our life, supplies the lifeblood in the body. Each one of us then has the supply and nourishment necessary to function as the foot or the ear or the eye or the hands. And every part, whether it's a ligament, uh, a tendon, a joint, whatever it is, we're functioning correctly. The body is working correctly and functioning because Christ is our supply of life. It's a beautiful imagery that Paul uses here. 
As I said, this is one of my favorite texts in all of Paul's writings. There's just so much that is so deeply rich about congregational life and who we are and how we're to function and the challenges we have before us. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help each one of us uh, to properly work as part of the body, that we would function to your glory and, and realize that we belong to each other because when we talk about joints and tendons and ligaments, everything is connected together. Nothing is separated. Help us to support and encourage each other to walk in the life worthy, worthily in which we've been called, uh, that we have a unity of the spirit that we're maintaining in the bond of peace. And it's so that the world may see and may know Father, that you have sent the Son so that Jesus can be the hope for the world. Um, be with us as we leave this place tonight that we can live out what we've learned. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here.